Uh, I guess I'm the new chair as uh, our um, other chair, as Trustee Horwitz is not able to attend. So as vice chair, I am now chair for now. <laughs> yes, the honor. Um, so I will call the meeting to order the uh, Federated City Employees Retirement System and Federated City Employees Health Chair Trust. And uh, I will uh, do a roll call vote. So uh, Trustee Chandra. Here. Trustee Kelleher. Here. Trustee Linder. Here. Trustee Abasti. Here. And I, Vice Chair Jennings, am here. So we are all here. Um, so I'd like to remind everybody to speak clearly, state their names for the record, and audio recording. All right. Um, the orders of the day, um, are there any changes to the orders of the day? No? Great. Um, is there anything we need to wave sunshine on? Great. Okay. So I think um, I'll call for a motion to approve the consent calendar. Trustee Kelleher, so motions. Great, Trustee Kelleher motions. Do I have a second? Yeah, Trustee Chandra, I'll second. Okay, Trustee Chandra seconds. Uh, can we do a roll call vote? So Trustee Chandra? Aye. Trustee Kelleher? Aye. Trustee Linder? Aye. Trustee Avasti? Aye. And I also vote aye, so it passes unanimously. Um, so we'll go through the agenda. And the first agenda item is um, the application for a service-connected disability retirement. Uh, so. Um, that one is time certain at 10 a.m., Chair Jennings. Yes. Oh. So we should move on to item three, which is death and survivorship, moment of silence. Okay. So um, item, uh, where is it? It's coming. coming. Right there. Okay. All right. So uh, can we have a moment of silence uh, for the death and survivorship of our city employees? Okay, thank you. Um, shall we move on to, uh, let's see, what's the next thing? <clears throat> item four. Item four. All right, uh, investments. Uh, so uh, CIO uh, Palani is not here. I believe uh, Jay is going to uh, give us the oral update. Yes, good morning. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll be super brief. Uh, as you can see, there are no, uh, well, there's only the one oral update uh, for investments on the agenda today. Uh, and, you know, we'll just a very few quick things to cover. Yes. As per custom, uh, I have the estimated returns, and this is through Valentine's Day. So uh, 214, year to date. So calendar year to date, the Fed pension is at 4%. Uh, and fiscal year to date, so this is from uh, the end of June 2022, uh, the Fed pension is at 4.4%. Again, these are estimated returns uh, provided by Makita. Um, and so uh, for Fed Healthcare Trust, calendar year to date, it's slightly better than Fed pension, it's 4.75%. Uh, and for fiscal year to date for the Healthcare Trust, estimated return is 6.29%. Hmm. That's good. Yeah. Not, not too bad, making some headway. Yeah. Uh, just, and, and then uh, just one quick heads up at the upcoming IC meeting, which is rescheduled at this point to March 1st, uh, there's gonna be a couple items on the agenda that will probably, uh, or that could appear for, uh, before this board again at your March meeting. And so at the IC meeting on March 1st, we'll be talking about uh, pre-funding uh, as well as strategic asset allocation. 
And so depending on how those conversations go at the IC, and those are both pretty big topics, which is why I just wanted to give you a heads up. Uh, those are at the IC meeting, depending on how the conversation goes, those could appear before your board uh, again later um, later on in March. All right, any, any questions? Any questions from trustees? No? Oh. Great, thank you. Okay, you know, um, Council Chin, I think we missed the, the public statement. Weren't we supposed to yes. do that? Yes. Um, that's we can go like, back and do that. Yeah, let's go back and do that. Um, so, yes, sorry about that. Um, after the orders of days, the public retiree general comments not related to a specific agenda item. And uh, I believe we limit it to what? Three minutes. Three minutes. Um, so is anyone here from the public that would like to say something um, that is related to uh, the retirement, but not a specific agenda item? This is your time. If there's anyone here, please raise your hand or um, join in. Okay, uh, I don't see any hands and I don't hear anybody. So um, thank you. And uh, let's, uh, all right. So next, that was three, right? How about yeah. four? So four. we just covered four. So we're going to the uh -huh. conflict presentation um, by Harvey and I on uh, conflicts of interest, undue influence. I will say, Trustee Jennings, this may be the fastest meeting. Uh, <laughs> we've had so um i'm going to go ahead and share my screen i have the powerpoint up if that's okay that would be great thank you sure um i i need a uh, administrative uh authority to share okay so i assume um someone in our admin yes that will be providing that in a second please okay. excellent we don't usually get the pleasure of being so uh high up on the chart. Uh, I know, I have to warm my vocal cords. <laughs> <laughs> We're thrilled and, and all we want to know first is, does everyone have sufficient caffeine? Yes. <laughs> oh, I hear a big cup, see? Just saying. I think oh, wow, it is that already, is uh, Maytag. Okay, uh, let's, no, I, here I go. Um, so if I, I need the staff to first stop sharing their screen so then I can share mine. <laughs> I think you just have to stop sharing. We have to. Okay. Yeah. I, I've got it now. There we okay. go. Can you see the? Um... Yes. Yes, you can. Gorgeous. Okay. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. So this morning, Harvey and I are going to give a refresher on the conflicts of interest, undue influence, uh, educational presentation to the board, and. Um, First, we're going to start with a refresher of the five fundamental fiduciary duties, which are set in the California Constitution, Article 16, Section 17. And there are five primary, uh, five primary duties. There's the primary duty of loyalty, which is the duty to work in the best interests of the members and beneficiaries in all aspects of the plan administration. To the exclusive benefit rule, which requires the board to use the assets of the fund for two distinct purposes only. One is to pay out the benefits when due, and two is to pay any reasonable administrative expenses. Now, part of the exclusive benefit uh, rule is that the board must conduct its due diligence in terms of determining whether or not the fees and administrative costs they're expending for the administration of the plan are indeed prudent. Third, that leads us to our duty of prudence. The duty of prudence imposes on the board a heightened standard of care, which we'll explain in further detail um, through the presentation. Uh, next, we have the duty to diversify the plan's assets to minimize risks and maximize returns. And lastly, we have the duty to follow the plan documents. Um, as the administrators of the plan, we do not get to design the plan. We simply must administer the plan based on the terms set forth in the San Jose Charter, San Jose Municipal Code, and our IRS do uh, rules and regulations. We need to also follow the plan, docu plan document in terms for another reason, which is to maintain our tax qualified status. 
Now, today we're going to be focusing on two particular fiduciary duties. One is the primary loyalty rule. And we call it the primary loyalty rule for one reason, which is that the duty of loyalty take precedent over the other five fiduciary duties. So you can consider it a primary loyalty rule in that sense. And as I mentioned earlier, the duty of loyalty requires you to act in the best interest of the members and beneficiaries and not to promote any other interest, whether personal or an interest of an other special interest group or an, a, another interest for um, the general public. So again, this duty of loyalty takes precedent over all other duties. Next, the other duty that we're going to focus on is the duty of prudence. Now, the duty of prudence requires you to exercise the care and skill of a knowledgeable, prudent person charged with similar duties under prevailing circumstances. So what does that mean? The duty of prudence requires you to be knowledgeable in all aspects uh, necessary for the administration of the plan. So if you do not have, <clears throat> excuse me, if you do not have that expertise, the duty of prudence requires you to go out and delegate it to someone who does um, for the administration of the plan. And the duty of prudence also, which we'll get into in further detail, really focuses on the process, the de deliberative process in terms of the administration of the plan to make sure that you're discharging your duties as someone who's knowledgeable and um, and charged with the same duties that you do have. So what does it mean to be loyal? Now, this board is an interested board and not a representative board. So you do not sit on the board in a representative capacity. This is not Congress. You're not... Uh, they're on the board to bring home the bacon for any particular interest group, which, which means once you're seated as a trustee, you have a constitu constituency of one, which is the members and beneficiaries. You're there to sit on the board to serve the best interests of the members and beneficiaries in the administration of the plan. Now, part of the duty of loyalty is the duty to avoid conflicts. This is one of the strongest tests to help you navigate your duty of loyalty. Part of the duty to avoid conflicts of interest includes, for example, avoiding serving others' interests, avoiding personal financial interests of your own, avoiding accepting gifts that could influence you in your position as a trustee. Now, in addition to the California law on duty of loyalty, the city of San Jose also has its own city ethics code, which we've also attached with your backup materials, which is here. So we strongly encourage the, the board to review the San Jose Code of Ethics. It's very specific, as you as you can, you can see as I scroll through, but the, there's three general bits to it, which are that you should not use your city position to, for personal gain or the appearance thereof, which is a really important thing I want to emphasize. It's not only that you actually get a um, personal gain, but anything that gives an appearance of a personal gain uh, by, by way of your position would fall under the, the city's ethics code. Another thing to be mindful of is um, the uh, trying to avoid situations which would hamper your independence and in rendering your official duties as a trustee. So if you feel com conflicted in, in any way and in terms of discharging your duties as a trustee, you may want to consider that uh, as a potential conflict, raise it with Roberto, Harvey, and I, and we can we can talk through that to see if it's an actual potential conflict that would hamper your independent judgment um, as a trustee on the board and your duty of loyalty. And lastly, this one's a pretty straightforward one under the city's ethics code, which is the same under California law, which is uh, avoiding gifts or other compensation that would unduly influence you. Now, whenever in doubt, disclose and recuse. So, so the rest of the board can take its action. And again, if you have any doubt or question of whether or not something may raise a conflict of interest issue or undue influence issue, please raise it with Harvey and I. So what does it mean to be prudent? Again, we mentioned this earlier, the duty of prudence really is about deliberative process and due diligence. And I want to remind the board that having a good process matters than good results. So now what in the conflicts of interest arena does good process mean? So that means having open and fair discussions about all board matters. So that's why we have the Brown Act. That's why we have open public board meetings. So we can invite all stakeholders to come and speak to any item before we take official action. 
And another, what, what else does it mean to be prudent? Which is, uh, it means to stay within the, the boundaries of good governance. So we have various policies and committees and whatnot and bylaws and charters with for the board's uh, governance. So it'd be prudent to stay within those guidelines because we've, we've worked hard to decide those would be the right parameters for the board's uh, conduct of business. This one seems pretty straightforward. Avoid any biases, pressures that impinge on good judgment and, and you wanna practice impartiality. So when you're sitting here as a trustee, you should try to take off your bias hat and think again, what is in the best interest of the plan in the long term? And lastly, we wanna focus on a culture of meritocracy. So we're again, we're, we are looking to what, what is good for the plan, materially good for the plan, so that we can discharge our duty of loyalty, which is to pay benefits when due uh, to our membership. Now with that, I am turning it over to Harvey, who will lead us through a number of scenarios. Okay, this is the time when you get to participate in this instead of uh, simply sitting back uh, and hiding behind the um, the stop video sign on the Zoom call. <laughs> <laughs> because um, um, what I want to say is this: uh, one of the reasons why we wanted to focus this presentation today on conflicts and the idea of uh, you know undue influence and what is influence is because you have an obligation, um, you, you can't, a, a, a board of trustees like this of five now, and generally seven people, cannot on a day-to-day -day basis run the affairs of a $4 billion pension fund. You devote um, some committee time, yes, but you, and, and only one day a month uh, to holding these meetings, and that's when you're supposed to be making all these decisions about the pension fund. So it's really incumbent upon you to delegate responsibility uh, to staff and to consultants, uh, and then to monitor them and make sure they're carrying out your instructions and duties. And so the attention is created about how much involvement should the board have in the day-to-day -day affairs of, of the system. Um, we have a few uh, hypothetical scenarios. I will tell you uh, that these are not hypothetical. Uh, I call them hypotheticals or just scenarios, but these are events in, uh, that have taken place in other of our client systems for real. And they're thought provoking and I wanna encourage you to participate in answering the questions about them and observing certain behaviors that you think are perhaps over the line or get trustees into trouble. So let's let's start with the first scenario. <clears throat> Let me take you through it and um, and then let's have a conversation about how this gives rise to potential issues um, that are run contrary to your fiduciary responsibilities. In this scenario, uh, let's just follow through. The, the chair of an investment committee of the Big City Employees Retirement Association, <laughs> names are not being used here, um, but you've got the chair of the investment committee it gets invited, and this happens a lot, to be a guest at a charitable fundraiser for disadvantaged high school youth that raises funds for financial literacy, a very good cause. Uh, so this is a charitable fundraiser. And the reason why it's a fundraiser is it's sponsored by two dozen prominent institutional investment management firms. And they've been promised in exchange for their sponsorship, the opportunity to socialize with trustees, kind of like you, trustees and investment executives, kind of like Jay, uh, from several Western state pension funds. So this charitable gathering will bring together investment managers and trustees. The general admission is $500 a person. That includes a meal, beverages, and a raffle ticket for the big door prize. The admission fee has been waived for guests like the chair of the investment committee. So they get to attend. This chair of the investment committee will be attending for free. <clears throat> and as you can imagine, the chair is very flattered to be invited to this and readily accepts it. And that evening at the event, uh, the chair is very thrilled to meet with representatives from two 
firms that investment staff just happens to be interviewing that week hmm. for new fixed income mandates. And the chair is very sociable and gracious. The chair graciously offers to put in a good word for both of those managers with investment staff. Okay, let's just pause there. I see Mark Linder is uh, pondering this. <laughs> Mark, Mark um, yeah, you, you, it seems to be a number of problems here. Um, in that it's, the person is there, they're getting basically lobbied to uh, bring this these other people in to help uh, invest in their in their uh, institute their firms. Uh -huh. it's just um, and what I didn't get but is the yeah I figured the admission was free. Yeah. So uh, that's a problem. Um, it's just uh, very what's the problem with that don't we all want to get a freebie once in a while well, I, we, i'm sure we all would want to get a freebie but not when you're dealing with uh, pension funds and uh being lobbied to put money into some new um, management firms that you really don't know anything about except that you're socializing with them it's a gift isn't it julie yeah say that again. isn't that a um gift um when you're getting a free admission five hundred dollars i mean i think the city limits their employees to like 250 a year well actually it's interesting no the state limit on accepting gifts from any source is like 540 dollars in a single 12-month calendar year this one says yeah however the city has a zero tolerance limitation yeah, on that the city ethics code which is what one should look at it is you can't yeah. accept any yeah. from any source right so let's go back to that slide um may take thanks so that, that in that middle paragraph where the 500 dollars value is bestowed yeah. upon the individual but i'll stay with julie for a moment julie is there a way that this if it were appropriate mm -hmm. how might this actually be acceptable well i think they would have to pay um so one they would have to pay for their admission okay that's one and the other is that if if this if this was brought to the board mm -hmm. yeah, and the true. board thought it was important in carrying out the responsibilities of the board to have somebody in attendance at this if they thought it was part of a reasonable expense of administering the system the board could pay the board could agree to have the system pay for it so right. it wouldn't be a gift to the individual right it would be an expense of operating the system but you notice that didn't happen here the chair of the investment committee just made the decision themselves because and and why do you think that was trustee of why why would why would a chair of an investment committee think that this was a good thing for them to do like attending the event itself yeah to, to go to to attend an event like this uh, i think attending the event uh, even if it is not a conflict of interest, it, it is an appearance of the conflict of interest. Okay. It's a good cause, though, don't you think? I mean, is there something wrong with supporting, you know, this is this is a, a fundraiser for disadvantaged high school youth in the community. But did they know who was sponsoring it? The sponsors no. must be public, right? Whenever, whenever, uh, as a trustee, I'll I'll say this: whenever you are the bait for attracting <laughs> money, that should cause your the hair on the back of your neck to go up, right? It isn't that really what's going on in this situation. The charitable fundraiser is a laudable goal. Of course, it has nothing to do with the administration of the pension fund. So it's it's serving a, an interest other than the members and beneficiaries of the system. It's a it's a laudable interest, 
to find interest. And if somebody wants to support it on their own nickel, that would be okay. But for someone in a trustee position to accept this as a gift, knowing it's being funded by people who are simply trying to get your business, that should give you some pause. Yeah, Harvey, the word promise kept jumping out at me. Um, the fact that the uh, sponsors have been promised an opportunity to socialize with trustees is very uncomfortable. Yeah. But I will tell you, Anirag, this, this goes on all the time. Well, can I adjust the fact pattern slightly? I don't know what your next scenario is. No, no, please. Go ahead. So we, I mean, we attend conferences that are informational and help us uh, understand the financial markets better and be better custodians of the plan. And some of those independent sponsors make um, uh, LPs like us available to general partners for one-on-one -on -one meetings. And I usually decline them because I tell them I don't get involved with manager selection. That's what our CIO does. But um, occasionally it's, it's valuable just to do a one-on-one -on -one and just hear the pitch and just hear their macro sense of what's going on. Um, but that the, the fact that I've adjusted the fact pattern, I mean, we're talking about an independent uh, group like Pension Bridge that throws conferences, uh, that, that's their raison d'etre. Um, usually the sessions are just informational, but they always have this little speed dating part of it as well. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I assume that's kosher because uh, a lot of trustees do it, <laughs> but it, <laughs> You know, it's that slight adjustment that makes all the difference. What What's the difference there that we should be mindful of that makes that okay? Well, it's, it is just there. It's like right up on the chalk lines and, you know, we have to consult the replay camera to see whether your, your toe was across <laughs> the line or in the line. That's right? a sort of subject with Eagles fans today. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I mean, you know, do you have chalk on your tip of your shoe or not? The, um, it is not an easy line to draw because there is an educational component. Notice in this scenario, we put in no educational yeah. component to it. It's purely social and access driven. Mm -hmm. um, but at a conference, if you go to a calipers conference or pension bridge or CII or something like that, you know, you're there to educate yourself. You just have to be very careful um, about what you say in those circumstances. In other words, take it in, but be careful what you put out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> be, careful what, be careful what you say and what you lead people to believe. The last paragraph of this scenario is, you know, I'll put in a good word with investment staff for two specific managers. Number one, you're probably violating the quiet period by even talking to managers who are candidates, right? Yep. And you know, there's whenever staff is conducting interviews to, to hire firms, which is in their wheelhouse, you've delegated that responsibility to them. What should the chair have said in this situation to those two managers? Anybody want to jump in on that? Yeah, I mean, I've been in similar situations, Harvey, though I don't attend these kinds of events, but because I'm in the venture capital universe, I get asked for introductions to yeah. our CIO all the time. And uh, I tell everyone that uh, um, I make them rarely. And when I do, uh, please don't talk to me again after I've introduced you to the CIO. Um, I'm not going to say anything positive or negative about you. I don't want to be seen to be putting the thumb on the scale. It's also not good for me as a practitioner in the venture universe. I don't want some firms to think I'm favoring ones or the other, and it's certainly not good for the plan or in terms of probity. So um, so that's what I tell people, and yet they always come, reach back out to me. Oh, I just went with the CIO. How do you think it went? I'm like, I have to remind you, I don't get involved after the introduction is made, and they've got their own process. I'm here in a governance and um, oversight role only. Yeah. Terrific. And you just wrote the best slide we could have written. <laughs> Hon yeah, honestly, pe people, are bad, people are bad listeners, though. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times they just come back and say, oh, you know, the CIO said blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I don't want to know what the CIO said to you. You have to have a lot of fortitude, you know, because, listen, in, in the irony is that 
if you start leaning on staff, and we're, we have a couple other scenarios that deal with that. If, if, if you as a board member step across the boundary of delegated responsibility and put your hand as, as on your, what's it, put, put your thumb on the scale, you've done so many things to undermine the good governance of the system. Exactly. And it takes real fortitude to, to turn these people down because it, the you know people want to do business with you. You're when you go out into the community and it's known that you are a trustee of a multi-billion-dollar pension fund, that attracts a lot of attention. You are suddenly the smartest, most charming person in the room. Wait. We weren't, I thought we were all that before we got appointed. <laughs> you know, trust me, you go to these conferences and when they find out that you're a trustee of a multi-billion dollar pension fund, you, you couldn't be smarter or more charming and a better golf partner or a tennis partner. <laughs> yeah, and have another two drinks of wine. And have yeah. another two drinks. So I don't want to dwell too much on this, but you know, you just have to be mindful of who you are and what it looks like to the general public. Because one of the things that, you know, Maytag was talking about um, and that we want you to constantly remember is they call you trustees for a reason. It's because people are putting their trust in you and you also need to trust each other. And if somebody has a personal interest that they're not disclosing and they're a board member, a, a fellow trustee of yours, and you're not aware of it, you're making decisions about the fund without really knowing, then you've, that, that really tears the fabric of trust among board members and it damages the level of trust that your members can have in you. So when you go out into the community that you're in, if you'll keep in mind that how, how precious that fabric is of trust with your members and yourselves, you won't go wrong. Your, your, your radar is gonna be pretty good uh, and, and you'll avoid these kind of situations. Let's go to the second scenario. This is a little bit different here. B. Sarah, that's the Big City Employees Retirement Association, has you know publicly announced that it's going to downsize its pool of private equity managers. It's got too many private equity managers after so many years, and it's going to call out the ones that are underperforming. Now, the mayor of the Big City hears about the plan and calls the trustee who sits as chair of the investment committee, and the mayor says, Listen, do what you want about cutting out some of these e private equity managers, but Wing and Prayer LLC is my biggest re-election contributor. If you terminate them, your time on this board is going to be short. We appointed you. We can unappoint you. Wing and Prayer is my biggest co contributor. They need to get something from us for all their contributions. So. Mindful of the warning from the mayor, the chair approaches the investment officer at the system and says, listen, don't mess with wing in a prayer, whatever you do, downtown wants them protected. But listen, the investment officer, only you can fix this. I can't go to the CIO. He's a stubborn cuss and he would do exactly the opposite if I told him to do this. So you take care of this quietly help bring in a prayer to survive, and you could be in line to succeed the CIO. <laughs> Trustee Kelleher seems to have some issue with some of this. What's the issue? Yeah, no, I actually am thinking of uh, a situation that was very similar with a plan that we were advising <clears throat> uh, where a uh, particular investment manager was flying trustees out to play golf in Ireland. Uh -huh. And uh, they were the single worst performing manager <laughs> in the history of the plan. Um, oh, and that particular trustee just fought 
tooth and nail for this particular manager. And it was just clear that, you know, it was, he'd been bought. Uh, he's no longer a trustee. No. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's just clear conflicts of interest everywhere. Um, and, uh, you know, the, uh, this trustee is, just wants to continue serving. Uh, so he's going to do whatever the mayor says, as opposed to having the loyalty to the plan. <clears throat> And he's putting the uh, investment officer in an untenable situation where he's uh, trying to uh, play with his career aspirations. It's just, this would be very bad to read about in the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> yeah, it's got some headline risk to it, doesn't it? But hey, guys, it goes on. It goes on all the time. Oh. Maybe not not here, but but I'm telling you, this is not fantasy and what what um following up on that trustee color how do you see the issue with the chair of the investment committee wanting to do the right thing but going around the cio well that's also just uh i'm not sure that the chair of the investment committee is wanting to do the right thing okay he is wanting to do what the mayor wants, not what the right thing is. And certainly going around the CIO is just awful. The CIO is who has been delegated to make these decisions, not investment staff, not the trustee. So once that governance decision is made, you need to live with it. Let me ask you this, and, and um, let, let, let's... Let's go back to Chair Jennings, um, if, if I may, on this one, Julie. And what would you, what would you, what would you, as a trustee, want the investment officer to do in reaction to what's just been so, said to them? By the mayor? No, the the chair comes to the investment officer. Uh, and says, okay. "Listen, fix this. I'm, you know, don't go to the CIO." This could be good for you for your career. What would you want your investment officer to do in that scenario? Well, the investment officer reports to the CIO, right? Right. Okay. So I would assume that the investment officer should go to the CIO and say, I have been, I had this request come through. And it is not right, you know, I'm very uncomfortable with this and let them know. And, you know, part of that is going up the, the chain, right? And good, then, good phrase. Pardon? That's a, that's a good phrase. Up, yeah. the chain, up the chain reporting. Right. So that's, that's what I would expect um, that an investment officer would do. So you want the investment officer to rat out the chair of the investment committee to the CIO. Right. And also, as a city employee, um, if you do that, you know, you're, you're notifying that. If you really think it's egregious, uh, you can also go to the Office of Employee Relations, too, and notify them. So, um, or, you know, who whoever your representative is, so that that is notified because you, you really need to raise that up if that happens as a city employee. Yeah, and, and everyone should know that there is a whistleblower policy in the city of San Jose to protect people who go up the chain and report behavior that they think is inappropriate yeah. uh, to to their superiors or to someone else in the city and can be and will be protected against retaliation now all that is nice and written in paper but it's a lot to expect a subordinate officer in this situation to turn in if you will turn state's evidence against the chair of the investment committee and what you've done is you've put the chair of the investment committee has put this investment officer in a very, very untenable position 
because most likely that investment officer in real life is probably going to start looking for work elsewhere because they can't do their job if a tr if a superior person in this role as a trustee is going to be leaning on them and pressuring them and it won't be an isolated event so you're most likely going to be driving out of the system the very talent that you spent so much time and money attracting and nurturing it can be very corrosive to an organization to have this kind of um, influence being generated uh, on those to whom you've delegated responsibility. But if the chair is getting twist, you know, arm twist by the mayor, yeah, then the chair is no longer serving the uh, pension, you know, recipients, and is not meeting their responsibility. Okay, because they're letting their desire to serve the mayor or to keep their position, because if the mayor pulls them off the position, right. which in some cities that can happen. Oh, yeah. And so their responsibility is to the people who receive the pension. What do you think the rest of the board would do if they heard about this scenario going down? Depends how the board works. <laughs> What's fascinating in our business is that um, boards are not, our, our pension boards are not given very much power to self-police behavior like this. Uh, this, this kind of thing happened in, in uh, uh, San Diego, uh, San Diego County's retirement system. This is a public matter. I'm not ratting them out. Um, maybe a dozen years ago, and the court held, uh, and the board tried to sanction one of their their own, uh, not just stripping them from um, being on committees, which you have the authority to do through the chair. But in the, in the San Diego instance, they tried to prevent the offending trustee from attending closed sessions and other meetings of the board. And that trustee sued and the court in San Diego said that the board didn't have the authority to, to go that far and, and sanction or punish an offending trustee. So we're not given much tools to self-police in that situation. And as a consequence, you have to rely on each other's good judgment to a large extent. Likely the board, this board in big city retirement would never hear of this going down. This would never see the light of day. Um, but whenever you see a situation where there's in the public sector where there's a quid pro quo being offered for campaign contributions, hmm. you should run for the exit. Yeah. <laughs> as, as Mark Keller said, you know, you wouldn't want to read about this in the above the fold <laughs> of the Merck. Right. Okay, let's go to scenario three, our last scenario, and then we'll, we'll wrap things up. Um, in this scenario, a trustee who's a registered investment advisor is actually presently unemployed and looking for new employment in the public equity space, public equities. During one manager interview, in other words, an interview the trustee has with a public equity manager, the interviewer hints that, you know, an introduction to the Sarah might help the trustee land that job. So the next day, the trustee approaches the CIO and tells the CIO that she believes this particular manager is terrific, top quartile, you, you, the CIO, should bring them in for contract talks immediately. Just don't bother about your usual vetting process. I know these people. You have my word on how good they are. Trustee doesn't bother to disclose to the CIO that she has a prospect for employment with this manager. 
Meanwhile, the CIO's team already rejected that particular public equity manager because they had 100% turnover in their senior executives last year. So, CIO gets approached by the trustee. The trustee says, get these people on board, bring them in for contract talks. I vouch for them. You have my word. They're terrific. Don't bother with your usual RFP process or some other process of reviewing them. What do you want the CIO to do in that situation? Yeah. Trustee Chandra? I was going to say, can I jump in? So you were, you were reading my mind. Like, isn't this a simple, the CIO, for, I mean, first of all, it's crazy that a trustee would say that, right? The whole point is to have process in place and due diligence procedures. So isn't it easy for the CIO to say, we went through our process, we went through our due diligence uh, checklist, uh, and uh, the manager didn't pass muster? Uh, isn't that, you know, the beginning and the end of the conversation? Well, Who's here for is um, any investment staff on the uh, right now listening in? Be curious to hear what their view is of this. David? Okay. I agree. Um, um, yeah, I mean, oh, go ahead. I mean, I agree with what Trustee Chandra was saying. I mean, I think the response should be you know, we've gone through our process and list out the reasons why it was, um, you know, didn't, didn't meet the criteria and leave it at that. Yeah, but do, if you were CIO, David, would you, you know, how, how would you handle, this is a powerful, this is the, the, you know, this is a powerful trustee. Are you comfortable in blowing them off? <laughs> Um, well, I mean, it's not quite blowing them off, right? I think it's, again, detailing exactly why, um, you know, why the investment doesn't pass muster. It's not, you know, it's not a, sh I don't think it would be a short discussion of, you know, we just, we don't like it, right? And I, I think just, you know, being able to give a, a detailed, well-reasoned rebuttal should be, um, should be adequate. Should the I'll I'll stay with you for one second, David. Should the should the CIO do anything more than that in this situation? Um, perhaps remind the trustee of you know the um, just I guess the separation of duties I guess, and and you know acknowledge their um, input, thank them for the input. And, you know, just welcome any further inputs on any other matter. Um, and, we'll, and, you know, such input will be taken into consideration. Okay. And, and, and but Harvey, but... Never mind that this trustee is not just putting uh, her thumb on the scale. She's sitting on the scale entirely. Uh, if she ends up employed, that she has to, she has to uh, quit the board. I mean, like, does she, there might be some education involved with her, uh, but I mean, I guess no one, I guess part of this is she's kept it confidential that she's interviewing. So um, yeah, it just seems like this trustee was not well-trained uh, to begin with on her fiduciary duties. Yeah, didn't, didn't sit through the program. No, but I do like David's answers because I think even, even though process ultimately is judgment in any investment, um, you can make the you can make the process this objective third party that's bigger than the CIO, bigger than the investment officer, and bigger than any trustee. Well, well put. Um, let me let me ask uh, Trustee Avasi um, if you were chair of the board, would you want the CIO to tell you about this conversation? I would expect the CIO to tell about the conversation. You would? Yes. I I also think that the trustee has not disclosed to the CIO. Uh, I think that's that's a missing link. And how would CIO would know uh, about that reference? Yeah. Uh, Harvey, 
Um, just a couple of things, if I may. But first of all, I am still surprised that these things are happening, obviously, yeah, in some uh, locations. Um, it's funny that you mentioned about reaching out to this to the chair because obviously, you know, that's was one of my thoughts. But what would you do if the chair is the one actually doing this? Who then do you speak? Um, or reach out to the board, right? Uh, I mean, I guess this is where experience comes to place and you need to, you you know who your players are, you know who are more in tune than others and, you know, the power across, you know, across the board. So you should know who you should be reaching out to. But what would you recommend? Besides, obviously, I guess the number one option would be the vice chair of the board. But if, if, you know, I think the scenario will be even more challenging if, if the chair is actually the one in this scenario, and not just... Uh, no, that, that's a very good point, Roberto. If the chair is the offending, shall we say, uh, person, you know, what recourse is there? Um, attorneys such as Maytag and myself are taught that the up-the-chain reporting, as Chair Jennings was describing it, our up the chair, uh, up the chain reporting is our obligation is to the entire board as the decision making body. You're a collective decision making body, not an, in, you know, each individual trustee. So in that situation, from our perspective, we would have to report the behavior to the entire board. Um, because it's something the board would need to know about. And that's what I would say in, when, you, when you talk about what if the chair is the offending party in this situation, there really is an obligation on the CIO to, to, to bring this up to the entire board so that the board can deal with it at yes. that level. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So to wrap this up, you know, the question is, how are we going to define what, you know, where, where we cross the line? Where's the chalk line here? What is undue influence? The difference between a trustee being reasonably interested and reasonably involved in investment decisions, for example, and undue influence can be a very tricky uh, distinction to try to make. But there, but there are some pointers that we can put down I think to help guide in this situation. One of them, the first one is any attempts to exert influence over decisions that your process has already delegated to others to do deprives the, response, the responsible individual of their ability to exercise prudent and independent judgment. Remember the people that you delegate to are fiduciaries as well. You can't, as a fiduciary, you can't delegate your responsibility to somebody who's not a fiduciary. So they are fiduciary to the system as well. And if you, and, and they have an obligation themselves to, to, to engage in a due process, fair, reasonable, balanced, unbiased decision-making. If you deprive them of that ability, then there's no way that you can be serving your own fiduciary responsibility. So anytime that as a trustee, you are interfering with a, someone you've delegated responsibility to and their ability to exercise judgment, that's a problem. Um, you know this from workplace environment trainings. Anytime a superior pulls rank over someone in an inferior position. That's a problem. And finally, actions that are motivated by your own personal interests and your, you know, your, your own career building or your own literally financial interests, those are trigger warning signs that you should be careful of what's going on. When you delegate authority and responsibility, they're fiduciaries to you, you are fiduciaries to the system. 
everybody needs to be able to do their work fairly and objectively. Anything beyond anything that alters that is is steps across the line, in my view, to being undue influence, and it should be avoided. You know, Harvey, uh, one thing you said there was pulling rank on uh, a subordinate, and certainly I've done that many times, just because my subordinate may not have the experience or the knowledge, and <laughs> I may feel, you know, without any undue influence or anything like that, no personal gales, that they're making the wrong call. And I think you have to have that ability to say, no, that doesn't work. And you can talk about why, but there are times where you have to pull rank. Well, if there's a, of course, I mean, in, in any collaborative environment, uh, you want to have a fair and open exchange of ideas. I think what we've seen in the scenarios that we raised this morning, that those scenarios were something more than just a fair and open exchange. Mm -hmm. that, that was someone dictating to somebody whose decision it is, dictating the outcome or attempting to dictate the outcome without any collaborative exchange whatsoever. So I think, I think there's a, qualitative difference between those, you're absolutely correct. But the atmosphere that you paint is very different from the ones that were painted in the scenarios. I would agree. I just had to speak. No, no, I, I, you're absolutely right. And I appreciate it. And that's what makes us so tough because one, one person's training is another person's influence wrongful influence you see what i'm saying it's how it's how it's perceived as much as how it's intended uh, and so we just need to be careful uh, uh, about if we're in a superior position understanding how our influence is going to be perceived and what effect it will have on on decision making well, i think it's the last part you're, if you're motivating them for personal interest or interest of you know someone else, that's where it goes wrong. But if you're on the investment committee and you have the expertise, and Trustee Kelleher and Trustee uh, Chandra certainly have the expertise in their areas, um, that's part of the reason why they're there, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Um, that okay. is a benefit. That's what they provide as um, for us as a whole and for BRAPU. Um, so that is all good. Um, it's the management. It's just where you're doing it for your own personal interest. I think okay. where it really goes wrong, you know. Gotcha. Any other comments or questions? Okay, I think Maytag, back over to you. We're, we're uh, I think we're pretty much able to wrap up. Thanks for participating this morning. I appreciate it. And um, it's very also, good. Also, keep in mind that at any time, if any of you have any questions or concerns in this regard, call toll free one eight hundred Roberta. I was going to mention that. I was going to mention that early when I first joined the board, and I was. Uh, just trying to make sure I kept my two worlds separate, but also benefited from the expertise that I have in my professional life and bring it to bear for the board, uh, but also make sure that the boundaries are drawn. You're very helpful, so people should definitely reach out to you. Maytag, you weren't with us then, but I'm sure that you're another great resource for us. Very good. Thanks. Madam Chair, back to you. Okay. Um, well, I guess we're on to new business, but... Um... If I can, how about if we just jump to um, 6C since we're all doing the legal thing and let you guys do the California okay. Assembly. Is that okay? And then we'll do the sure. oral updates. Okay. So with the backup materials provided to you, the governor's proclamation remains in state, in its current state due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the city council for San Jose continues to recommend social distancing. So this would be the last time this board can renew its AB 361 findings 
which will carry you into your March meeting for virtual meetings. So our first in-person meeting, assuming everything is uh, going to be lifted, meaning the proclamation from the governor on the end of this month will be our first in-person meeting. So the two factual findings again are the um, government, the governor's proclamation for the state of emergency due to COVID-19 remains in place and the San Jose City Council continues to recommend social distancing. Uh, these two factual findings will allow you to meet virtually if adopted by majority vote for the next 30 days. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, uh, do I have a motion um, to accept this? Yes, uh, Vice Chair Jennings, I will make a motion to accept the uh, AB361 findings. Excellent. And do I have a second? I'll oh, second. second. Okay. Um, Trustee Linder seconds and roll. Uh, is there any public discussion or um, trustee discussion on this? No? Okay, so I'll do a roll call vote. Trustee Chandra. Aye. Trustee Kelleher. Aye. Trustee Linder. Aye. Trustee Abasti. Aye. And I also vote aye carries unanimously. Um, Mr. Chair Jennings, can I ask a quick question before you move back to A and B? Sure. Are we in person, therefore, at the April 20th board meeting uh, and any committee meetings uh, as of April 1st? Yes. Correct. Unless you want to post something on your residence. Right. Uh, there, there, are, there are a number of, uh, in, you know, Trustee Chandra, we can talk about this offline if you would like to explore some of these. So AB 2449, which we uh, covered last fall, uh, was a new legislation putting in place virtual attendance rules. Um, for that, under that, those rules, it's either you have a, an emergency as specified under the statute, or um, there's a personal reason as well. So uh, we can talk about that offline, okay. but they're very, very strict in terms of um, what what qualifies, but we, we can certainly explore that. Alternatively, as Trustee Jennings has mentioned, you can also do the old school Brown Act um, posting of your location um, wherever you are. So we, we yeah. can discuss those options offline. Okay, thank you. Let me let me just add to that, Trustee Chandra. Thank you for the question. I plan uh, to come forward at our meetings in March for both boards with an update on, on having these meetings in person, um, where they're going to be the meetings. For the most part, we're gonna go back to our usual location. Those of you that uh, have a longer tenure with the board and attend the board meetings prior to the pandemic, it will be a city hall. But they, they are a couple of these meetings that they still be a city hall, but most likely at the council chambers uh, maybe just uh, two or three of them throughout the uh, the rest of the year. So I, I plan on coming back next uh, next month with that information for all of you to keep you posted. And as you know, uh, when we do have uh, committee meetings after the board meetings, they will be in the same location, except for, as you well know, Trustee Chandra, the investment committee meetings uh, that are separate from the board meetings, we intend to continue having those here at our fifth floor in our location. So again, okay. more information to come, but I'm glad you asked the question. Thank you. Great. Okay. All right, uh, let's uh, move on to new business uh, A, the oral update from uh, the CEO, uh, Mr. Yes. Kenya. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. If you bear with me, just a couple of minutes. I think I mentioned before, but if I haven't, I tend to forget to which board I have mentioned this. Um, Linda Alexander will be retiring. Her last day uh, is March 30th. Mm -hmm. I don't think if anything to do with going back in person on April 1st, but you just never know. In any case, she's leaving us and she has uh, a few more weeks working with us. We may have the opportunity to welcome her back after retirement uh, with some help in this area. But the reason I'm letting you know that is um, I want you to join me this morning in welcoming um, 
our new executive assistant. She's actually just joined us last uh, Tuesday, and she is actually working and getting some experience working alongside Linda for uh, this month and next. Her name is Isela Chaparro. Good morning, Isela. Welcome to our office. Um, uh, Isela actually come to us from the mayor's office where she supported mm -hmm. Mayor Ricardo um, over the past three years as uh, his executive assistant. And prior to that, she worked in the city manager office for 12 years, supporting uh, a number of senior leadership across the uh, uh, the city manager's office and, and and also the director of office of economic development. So she has a lot of good experience and um, knowledge uh, of the city processes and city uh, senior staff. And so uh, I'm very excited to welcome Isela. And so you will. You will be working with her, hopefully, uh, for many years to come. So once again, uh, congratulations to Linda. Assuming the board approve your retirement at the next meeting, Linda, I hope that's okay. You just never know what can happen. And welcome, Isela. Um, also wanted to mention you have received an email a couple of times regarding our joint meeting uh, with the city council. Um, the two uh, dates available are March 23rd and March 30th. That's a Thursday. Uh, the meeting is scheduled from 1.30 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. And it is an in-person meeting. Um, my understanding right now is that it's scheduled to probably take place at our own location, what is called the wing rooms at this uh, a city hall. Uh, uh, which is rooms 118 through 120. Uh, it still need to be uh, confirmed uh, through the rules committee as well as the agenda. We're still working on the agenda uh, for that. But just want to let you know two things. If you have not responded to the email by staff, please respond because we need to get back to the city uh, by Friday on which day uh, is the preference day, preferred day for the trustees. The challenge that we have right now is that as of this morning, um, we did ask uh, all trustees and consultants, and that includes uh, Mikita and Veros, uh, Chiron, and obviously Council Harvey and Maytag, and it's pretty even, about 13, 12, uh, between one day and the other. Uh, so right now, we don't know which day is going to be. We sort of leaning toward March 30th because we have uh, no, only one more trustee available for March 30th than March 23rd. Mm -hmm. um, we also have quorum for both boards for March 30th. And I believe it's also the preference day uh, for the city uh, senior staff as well. So we're leaning toward March 30th, but it hasn't been decided. I think many of you that have responded indicated a preference. So hopefully, if we pick one day of the other, you'll still be able to attend. But there are a couple of you that are available for only one of those dates. Hopefully, we end up with the date that you are available. If not, I apologize. But again, that decision will be made on Friday, and it's sort of looking toward possibly March 30th. Mm. Um, with that, let me just say one more thing. We do have uh, a staff specialist position available in our um, administrative staff, and we are in the process of working with uh, the CDHR to start the recruiting process for that position. Um, and I also want to remind you, you received an email from staff earlier uh, in the month that the um, the application deadline for the uh, public member vacancy for federated mm -hmm. actually was extended through uh, 5 p.m. on February 28th. Uh, we have received three applications so far, so that's good. I just wanted to remind you all in case you know anyone that will be interested in applying. And lastly, just want to let you know that the office will be closed uh, for in observance of President Days uh, for Monday, February 20. Um, Madam Chair, that concludes my uh, reporting and happy to uh, entertain any questions. Thank you.
Hey, are there any questions for Roberta? Just wanted to say welcome to Isela. Great. So she actually in the position, Roberta? Yes, Thank she you is all. Nice to meet you all. <laughs> and we'll Hi, Isela. Yeah, she's in the position. Uh, Julie, we, I always forget how you call that, but we, we have is selling the position, and I think yeah. Linda. Linda's in an overstrength, maybe. Yes, correct. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. what it is. And <laughs> and I, I apologize if you give me a second. I, I forgot to mention something in my uh, oral update. I do want to mention the guarantee purchasing power. That is the uh, the payment that keeps retirees uh, up to a seventy five percent purchasing power level from the time they retire. That payment will be made this month in February. Um, obviously, the cost of living increase will be available for the April mm -hmm. meeting, April mm -hmm. paycheck, uh, excuse me. <laughs> we did issue all the 1099 R's uh, by January 31st. Um, and also wanted to mention that uh, the 415 limit uh, letters we have a, a, a number of federated uh, members that are impacted by uh, internal revenue code section 415b limits in their pension. Those letters will be going out uh, next month in anticipation of the cost of living and 415 2023 adjustments for the April paycheck. Lastly, I do want to welcome to the office and new senior benefit analyst, uh, Amy Dickinson. Amy actually will start with us on Tuesday, February 21st. She actually uh, comes from the private industry uh, mm -hmm. where she worked uh, as an office manager for many years in different locations, although she does have some prior experience with the city as well. So Amy, welcome to RRS. We look forward to working with you. And thank you, uh, Ms. Jennings, for allowing me to provide this for the information. Yeah. Is Amy a senior analyst, senior benefit? She analyst? is a senior benefit analyst, correct. Okay. All right, sounds good. Okay, so um, let's move on to the oral update from the City Council Liaison, uh, Council, uh, Council Member Davis. Good thank morning. You. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we, my only update is that we are in the midst of our uh, budget process. So it already started on Tuesday. We had our first of two study sessions about priority setting with a report out from the five transition committees that the mayor's office <laughs> put in place. So we will have our second meeting about priority setting on February 28th. And I think that is the same, yeah, that's the same day that the five-year budget forecast will also be um, received by council and discussed. So we have, uh, <laughs> we have started the, the budget process and um, at our next meeting, I'll have a better sense because our forecast will have been out. What our um, what our outlook is for the upcoming year, and that's it for me. Although I did have a question about um, the March meetings. The city council is going back in person in March, not in April. So I'm confused about the um, the retirement boards not being in person in March. Did I misunderstand that? Sure. So the, the under AB 361, it allows the board from the 30 days from the date it makes a decision to renew their AB 361 findings to meet at the next 30 days within that period virtually. So because their meeting is 30 days from this meeting in February, they're allowed under AB 361 to continue to meet at that next March meeting virtually. Thereafter, there will be no governor's proclamation, so they cannot renew. And so they will be in person in April. Okay, thank you. I thought that everybody had to be back in person by March. That was that was my understanding with the the way that the, all of the council committees and everything are meeting. Education, right? <laughs> Learn something new every day. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, any questions for the city council live on? Nope. Okay, thank you very much, Council Member Davis. Um, so, what time is it? It is 
946, uh, and we have number seven is what? Just the... Yeah, I think we can make it through these reports in 15 minutes. Okay. 14. All right, uh, let's uh, move on to that. So uh, the investment committee, uh, any... We, uh, we, I just rescheduled, uh, I, I think, as uh, Jay mentioned, to March 1st for our next committee meeting, and we're going to discuss the strategic asset allocation, which will obviously be a board discussion as well, so that's more of a preview discussion, and the pre-funding, um, and I believe we're also going to be talking about renewal of our contracts with our consultants. Mm. Okay. Any questions for the investment committee? Okay, I assume we just go on to the next, right? Yep. <laughs> uh, governance, um, that's uh, me. Um, nope, there's, uh, we've just been doing the special meetings. There's no new things, nothing to report. Um, you want to receive and file the minutes. Uh, Mr. Okay. Yes, yeah, same, right. same for the special IC. Sorry, <laughs> I receive and file those two. Okay, receive and file our minutes as well um and so audit committee uh trustee kelleher you are is he on mute um, yeah he's trying to oh Mark, his, you're on yeah. mute. sorry sorry about that it's only three years of the pandemic <laughs> uh, so we had a special meeting on january the 19th our next regular scheduled meeting is on today later today uh, so I'll be able to give a, a better update. Uh, well, I would be able to give a better update next month, except I'm going to be gone. Uh, mm -hmm. So the only thing we have are the minutes to uh, receive and file. Okay. Trustee Linder, uh, Disability Committee. Yes, the uh, <clears throat> committee had a special meeting. Uh, we're also still continuing our training, which will happen again in March. Um, and then I guess we'll take cases after that, and I can uh, receive and file the minutes. Okay. And um, Joint Personnel Committee, uh, Trustee Chandra? Uh, oh, am I? Okay, I thought I was on mute. Um, <laughs> the Joint Personnel Committee is meeting quite consistently and continues to do a lot of work on both um, CEO compensation and CIO and investment staff compensation, as well as working for the CIO and the CIO's staff on a incentive compensation program. Um, I don't think there's anything too meaningful to report right now. This is joint, so you know we're getting input from our police and fire brethren, um, I, and our committee is doing some good work too. Uh, I do want to uh, a shout out to Trustee Lanza and Trustee Gardner who have done some really good work with the consultants outside of the committees, and then our, on our end, Trustee Horowitz. Um, but that's it for now. Uh, please receive and file the. Uh, I, I think those are minutes from us now those are minutes from a real meeting yeah. <laughs> so please receive the file okay sounds good do i need to do any motions on these or is that good enough nope nope no motions okay uh education and training we're uh uh it's just um what's out there right uh the calipers uh, program schedule has been released uh that's in march uh the general assembly uh, and the advanced principles of pension governance at UCLA is the end of March. And SACR's annual spring conference in San Diego. Okay, um, that's kind of it, right? Um, no motions, no nothing, right? So we need to go back. Um, maybe this is time to take a break. Mm -hmm. How about that? All right, so let's take, uh, um, so it's going to be a longer break, but we need to get back at um, 10 and, yes. for the uh, disability. Um, uh, there's two items on disability, uh, and we'll start 
Where's the other one? What happened to that? On the agenda? Oh, there it is. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, that, that was approved already with the consent. Did, did the did the I forget this that did the board approve the consent agenda? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that one was approved on consent. Which is ah, very cool. The, okay. the the two. If you can move off the page, thank you. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's under consent. Yeah, okay. that one is the disability hearing that starts at ten a.m. One point okay. one. And then at that point, we've done everything else. So, um, all right. So let's meet back at 10. And um, that's a nine minute break, everybody. Thank you. All right.
and start. Um, we're going to now uh, hear the application for service connected disability retirement uh, number A. So uh, this is an application for their service connected disability retirement for Sara Sadegapur. Um, Sara Sadegapur is represented by attorney Todd Johnson. Will attorney Todd Johnson and Sarah Sadegapur please unmute your microphone and will you be presenting any witnesses other than yourself? No other witnesses. Okay, excellent. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Stacy Fisher who will present the summary of the application. Hi, um, okay, the applicant's name is Shara Sedagotpour. Her attorney is Todd Johnson. Her application is for a change of status from service retirement to service-connected disability retirement. Parts listed on the application are neck, right shoulder, left shoulder, right hand, left hand, and right shin. The date the disability retirement application was received was 7716. Current status is service retirement effective 7916. Status at the time of separation was disability leave. Status at the time of application was disability leave. Work restriction is no repetitive overhead lifting or working with arms above shoulder level. Department accommodation of the work restriction is that the Environmental Services Department could have accommodated the work restriction at the time of separation and additional work restrictions received by the Office of Employee Relations could not be accommodated. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Todd Johnson and Sarah Degapur will please confirm that you received the staff letter dated February 3rd, 2023, notifying you of this board meeting. Yes, yes I did. Okay, great. Since you're here, I assume you have, right? <laughs> um, will you stipulate to the relevance of the reports to the review of the disability retirement? Yes. Okay. Do you wish to introduce additional medical reports or other documentary evidence for the board's consideration? No. Okay, great. Um, so, um, please identify all witnesses who will be testifying on Sahara Begapur's behalf. The employee only. Okay, thank you very much. All right, I'd like to introduce Russ Rachita, a disability counsel, to summarize the committee's position, basis for the position, and evidence in record supporting the position. His memo is included in the attachment provided for the item. Um, hi, um, Russ Rachita here, and would like to present the um, recommendation of the disability committee and the committee's rationale. Uh, just as background reminders, um, uh, the disability committee did keep in mind that the burden of persuasion was on the applicant. The committee recalled that the applicant meets the burden of persuasion through the submission of reliable, competent medical evidence, and medical evidence that was speculation was not to be relied on. Um, and, and perhaps it's useful to note in, in the situation or the context of this application that where there are conflicting medical reports, such as on the issue of work restrictions, it was up to the committee at its stage, and now it's up to the board to weigh those reports and decide which they find mo uh, most persuasive. Um, there are six conditions um, before the board today. Uh, the applicant's right finger and hand, the applicant's left hand, neck, left shoulder, right shoulder, and right shin. And with the uh, board's um, um, approval, I'll now try to briefly go through 
each of those conditions. The main condition is the applicant's right finger and hand. The applicant did have osteoarthritis in her hand prior to the incident that's the main focus of the application today. Uh, on July 24th, 2014, the applicant tripped and fell while climbing stairs in the city hall garage. Um, on that incident, or on the day of the incident, the applicant went to her personal physician and received a splint. A month later, she went to US Health and x-rays taken that day showed a fracture of, the, of her right little finger, a so-called mallet finger or baseball finger, where the result is that you cannot straighten the end joint of the affected finger. With respect to the fracture, Ms. Sadakatpur had surgeries uh, a few months later, the first one on December 19, 2014, and then a second one to remove some of the wire placed in the initial surgery, with that second surgery occurring on January 23, 2015. Uh, jump, um, to remind the board, the relevant date for determining service for um, uh, determining incapacity and service connection, the two issues before the board, is the date of separation for Ms. Sadakatpur. And that relevant date is July 2016. That is when the applicant was separated from employment. So it's about two years after the July 2014 incident. Um, um, at, at about the time of July 2016, a month later, a workers' compensation physician, Rick, Richard Gravina, uh, determined that, she, that Ms. Sadaghatpur had a fair amount of extension of the right little finger, even though the main symptom of mallet finger or baseball finger is you can't strengthen, uh, straighten the uh, end joint of the finger. But uh, Dr. Gravina found that she had a fair amount of extension of the right little finger. He also noted that there was no joint swelling, no heat, no redness, and both, uh, and two other phys physicians, uh, James Persh, uh, a treating surgeon who uh, gave the applicant several injections, and also uh, uh, Dr. Wiedemeyer noted that she had full range of motion of the entire right hand. So that's kind of the history of the right hand and finger. Now, going to incapacity, uh, I think it's important to note that the surgeon who, who gave Ms. Sadakatpur several injections, the name of the surgeon was James Perch, did not provide any work restrictions for her. And Dr. Stern, the board's independent medical examiner, as, and in addition, the board's then medical advisor, Susan Tierman, also concluded that no work restrictions were applicable to Ms. Sadakapur's right finger and hand. They noted that given the inability to um, um, uh, uh, close, I'll say, the, uh, the little right little finger, it'd be harder to, to get the right hand into a pocket or perhaps use the computer keyboard, but that that was not a sufficiently significant impairment to amount in their eyes to a disability. Now, on the other hand, Dr. Gravina, in his August 2016 report, uh, con said that an appropriate work restriction for the applicant's right hand and finger was simple manipulation. Though he extended that uh, work restriction to both hands, which in the context of the overall, uh, in the context of both hands, was, was not an appropriate analysis. Uh, Dr. Wiedemeyer, uh, another treating physician of the applicant, in June 2016, uh, provided a work restriction of no work with uh, her right hand. 
the disability committee in reviewing those reports uh, found that Dr. Stearns's report and the report of Dr. Tierman to be more persuasive, more analytic, containing a more robust uh, reasoning uh, on why work restrictions were not appropriate as compared to the reports of Drs. Gravina and Wiedemeyer. Um, that's incapacity. Now, in service connection for the right hand and finger, um, yes, there was an incident on July 24, 2014. The medical evidence is clear on that. Uh, and it's clear that there were surgeries to the right finger. But what uh, is, is uh, not clear, and as to this issue, the applicant has not met her burden of persuasion in the committee's eyes, is the total uh, is the picture of right pain to her right hand, which is a theme following the July 14th incident. But um, uh, the committee concluded that the, the July 2014 incident would not have contributed to her right hand pain. That instead was a function of her osteoarthritis, which is a progressive uh, condition. And the July 2014 incident did not aggravate her right hand arthritis. So those, those, that's the committee's um, conclusion and analysis as to the incapacity and service connection as to the applicant's right finger and right hand. Now moving on to the left hand, there was also osteoarthritis in the applicant's left hand. What's significant is that at the time of the July 24, 2014 incident, and by the way, I should have mentioned before, there were no, there are no other work incidents that have been, uh, that are reflected in the medical evidence and that have otherwise been raised. So, so the only work issue relates to the July 24th, 2014 incident. At that time, um, the applicant raised no complaint about her left hand. Instead, we jumped to April 19th, 2016, over a year and a half later, where Ms. Sadaka Port dropped a skillet on her left hand, causing pain. There's still no clear diagnosis for the left hand, and Dr. Stearns, when he examined her, found a full range of motion in her left hand. Uh, looking to incapacity as to the left hand, there, the medical record does not uh, indicate any work restrictions were provided as of the relevant date of July 2016. And doctors Tierman and Stearns uh, uh, concluded, each concluded that no work restrictions were appropriate for the applicant's left hand. As to the service connection of the left hand, uh, it's important to note that the applicant did not raise any complaints about her left hand at or after the July 24, 2014 incident. There were no other work events in the medical records that affected her left hand. She, the applicant did not complain about the left hand until June 2015, many months after the incident. And the committee considered that it was uh, speculation total speculation to link the July 2014 incident to the left-hand complaints that arose in June 2015. And this seemed particularly uh, to be the case for the committee because for most of the period of time between July 2015, I'm sorry, July 2014 and June 2015, the applicant was either on a leave of absent, absence or on modified duty. Uh, now, uh, moving on to the neck condition. As to the neck, there's no clear diagnosis, no x-rays were taken, no imaging studies. Um, so it's a mystery. As, as to the incapacity with respect to the neck, no work restrictions had been provided as of July 2016 from any treating physicians. Dr. Stearns and Tierman both concluded that no work restrictions were appropriate. Dr. Gravina, on the other hand, provided a work restriction of no prolonged forward flexion of the neck. But the committee felt, uh, or after reviewing this report, concluded that he did not provide a persuasive rationale 
with that work restriction. As to service connection for the neck, again, the applicant made no complaints about anything affecting her neck at or after the July 2014 incident, and there were no other work incidents affecting her neck. The first complaints about the neck provided by the applicant did not occur until, as I mentioned, June 2015. Uh, it appeared, the committee concluded that it was speculation to link the neck complaints in 2015 to the July 2014 incident. Again, as I mentioned before, particularly because most of the period of time between July 2014 and June 2015, the applicant was either on a leave of absence or on modified duty. Now, moving on to the left shoulder, um, um, Ms. Sazakhadpour did have a rotator cuff tear for which she received surgery in November 2016. She also possessed a type of bone in her in the area of her shoulder, uh, the acromion that was downward sloping. And as Dr. Tierman had mentioned to the committee uh, in previous uh, applications, that a downward sloping acromion wears away the muscle in the shoulder over time. Um, and in point of fact, something like that appears to have occurred here. Uh, as to incapacity, uh, Dr. Stearns and Tierman, in light of the rotator cuff tear and eventual surgery, provided a work restriction of no overhead work or lifting. And with respect to that work restriction, the department indicated that it could have accommodated it. Now, the committee noted that Dr. Gravina provided an additional and, and somewhat more strenuous work restriction for the left shoulder of no lifting the left arm over 90 degrees. But the doctor did not provide any explanation for this restriction, and the committee found it uh, 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 inappropriate to conclude that such a work restriction was appropriate. Dr. Wiedermeyer pro provided even greater restrictions for the left uh, shoulder, but again, did not provide, in the committee's eyes, a sufficient explanation. As to service connection for the left shoulder, uh, it is very important to point out that the applicant did not complain about any left shoulder pain at or after the time of the July 2014 incident. Uh, the applicant did not note any left shoulder pain complaints until August 2016, over two years after the incident. The committee considered it speculation to link the two, the uh, pain, left shoulder pain in August 2016 to the July 2014 incident, particularly since the applicant, as I noted before, was on a leave of absence or on modified duty most of the time between those two dates. Uh, now, moving on to the right shoulder, uh, again, no diagnosis, no x-ray, no imaging studies. As to work restrictions for the right shoulder, Dr. Tierman did provide the same restriction as to the left shoulder because of, of no overhead working or lifting because um, the, left, the right shoulder would likely have had the same downward sloping and chromium that the left shoulder did. The department uh, indicated it could accommodate those that work restriction. The, with respect to service connection of the right shoulder, the applicant at or after the July 2014 incident did not complain of any right shoulder um, pain or injury, and there were no other work incidents affecting her right shoulder. The applicant did not raise any uh, complaint about her right shoulder until June 2015. Uh, and as we've mentioned before, the committee considered it speculation to link the July 2014 incident to the reports of pain uh, approximately a year later, particularly since during that period of time, Ms. Sadakapur was on a leave of absence or in modified duty for most of that time. The last condition at issue was her right shin. Um, she did uh, uh, suffer abrasions to her right shin uh, uh, during 
um, the July 24, 2014 incident, but there was no complaint of right shin pain at or after that incident. There was no medical treatment for the right shin at or after the July 2014 incident. And the first complaint of right shin pain by the applicant was not until August uh, 2016. Uh, as to incapacity in the right shin, no work restrictions have been provided as of July uh, 2016, the relevant date. And as to service connection, um, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the applicant did not complain of right shin pain on or after the July 24, 2014 incident. There's no other work event that occurred that affected the applicant's right shin. And as mentioned previously, the committee felt it was speculation to link the uh, uh, July 2014 incident to the report of right shin, shin pain many months later. Um, uh, that uh, constitutes the report by the Disability Committee. May I ask you for a favor, please? Um, I am on an iPad and it's difficult for me to see the participants. And if you would remove this page, then I can see everybody. Um, can uh, someone? In... Yeah, we can remove the, the page. Yeah, because it's just a, an agenda item anyhow, not showing presentations. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, thank you very much, um, Russ, and let's uh, move on to uh, any representative. Is there any representative from Environmental Services Department who wishes to add anything to the department memo dated July 13, 2016 on accommodation of work restrictions or wish to present any other testimony relevant to the issues to be determined in the hearing? Yeah, Casey Fitzgerald, Senior Environmental Program Manager with ESD. We have nothing else to present at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, is the return to work coordinator present and do you wish to add anything to the memo dated on October 6th, 2016 on accommodation of work restrictions or wish to present any other testimony relevant to the issues to be determined in the hearing? Hi, this is Sarah Steele, the City of San Jose's Return to Work Coordinator. Uh, we don't have anything else to add at this time to the October 6, 2017 memo. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, um, Todd Johnson and Sahara Sadegapur, uh, please present your testimony in support of your case. So, I would first like to uh, address the medical evidence in this case. So we have a conflict in the medical evidence between Dr. Garbina, who was the workers' compensation agreed medical examiner, Dr. Kale Wiemeyer, who is the treating physician versus the IME, Dr. Stearns and Dr. Tierman. So Dr. Garbina is a neutral evaluator. He is not hired by one position or the other, he was agreed to by the City of San Jose's Workers' Compensation Department and my office to be an agreed evaluator and provide independent, neutral opinions. Dr. Garvina has provided uh, several reports indicating that the fall caused an injury to the right upper extremity uh, resulting in severe loss of use of that extremity that does preclude the claimant from continuing in her job. Dr. Wiedemeyer has been a long time treating doctor for the patient, I believe since June of 2015. He also agrees with Dr. Garvina and finds that due to the fall and the right upper extremity limitations, she has a preclusion from forceful and repetitive use of the right upper extremity. 
So you have two neutral evaluating doctors that do find that the claimant cannot continue in her usual and customary job. And I know since she's retired, she hasn't worked in any positions. Um, she got a significant disability through workers' comp at 70%. The doctors found that the fall led to a significant disability. The workers' compensation judge agreed and awarded her these benefits. So there's this uh, discrepancy between what the city doctor, Dr. Stearns and Dr. Chairman found versus what the treating doctor and the neutral evaluator found in workers' compensation. Uh, so that's basically the medical evidence for the right upper extremity. Um, I know my client would like to address the committee and explain the problems that she has with her right upper extremity. So Shark, could you explain to the committee the problems that you have with your right hand? Um, yes, thank you, Todd. Um, and thank you everybody for um, meeting. Um, I wish I could uh, meet you all in person so you could actually see me. Um, you could see my hand. Um, um, I'm right-handed and I cannot use my right hand. Um, this whole thing, this whole accident has been the biggest nightmare in my life. I was a very active person. I was a runner. I worked out five days a week. I was a very hardworking person and I loved my job. And I always thought that I'd be working till I'm 75 years old. Um, but unfortunately, today, I can barely put my hair in a ponytail because I have no use of my right hand. Um, and it's really, really sad to see that it's been documented and over and over again from different doctors what I've been through and what my diagnoses were and what I suffered. Um, Dr. Stern, who was the city doctor, spent 15 minutes with me in his office and was incredibly rude to me, had already decided what was, he was going to write. So, and Dr. Chairman, who also works with the city, determines her finding based on Dr. Stern's finding, not the two neutral evaluators who spent, Dr. Gardena spent two days with me. Dr. Wiedemeyer has seen me for years on a monthly basis. And I did not have arthritis in my hands. The arthritis was caused by the trauma later, much later. Um, so I don't understand where this information is coming from. We're all trying to live a life. And here's, here is my hand. Several years later, I hope you can see this. I do not have a grip. I, can, I wish you could see my hand. So I live a miserable life that I cannot even do simple things for myself anymore. OK. Um, is there more you want to say? Or I'm sorry. Do you need no, a moment? No, thank okay. you. Do you need a moment? It's OK. Thank you. OK. So uh, Todd Johnson and Sahara Segaport, would you like to question any of the witnesses who have testified? No one has testified. So I do have a question for the return to work coordinator. Okay, go ahead. So my question is that if um, it was found that the work restrictions by treating doctor, Dr. Wiedemeyer were followed, um, no um, use of the upper extremity for forceful or repetitive activities, loss of digital dexterity, limitation to light work, no above shoulder work, would the uh, department be able to accommodate those limitations? Um, so the restriction that we were provided, which it sounds like repeating, is no repetitive overhead lifting or working with arms above shoulder level. 
is that not what you just said? Because that's what it sounded like to me that you just described. No, so that was based on Dr. Chairman's report, but Dr. Wiedemeyer and Dr. Gervina provided more extensive work restrictions. So I'm just wondering, were you ever provided those work restrictions? Because at the time of a workers' compensation case, she was informed that the city of San Jose could no longer accommodate her restrictions by Dr. Gervina and Dr. Wiedemeyer, and she was provided vocational revoltation. So is that the case that they could not accommodate the restrictions of the agreed medical examiner, Dr. Gervina, and the treating doctor, Dr. Wiedemeyer's restrictions? So I have to go based on the information that we had, which is all listed in the memo. Um, the restrictions that we had in 2016 <clears throat> were the no use of the right upper extremity and limited use of the left upper extremity. Those were the restrictions that were provided to the city on January 16th. Um, they were temporary restrictions at that point in time. And so at that time, we were not able to accommodate them in her current position and she was placed on a leave of absence as a form of reasonable accommodation as they were temporary restrictions. Um, they remained, as far as our records are indicating in the letter, the memo that we submitted, those remained her restrictions through February, March, and June of 2016. Um, but again, they were all still temporary. There wasn't, she wasn't permanent and stationary. Those were, those continued to be temporary restrictions. Um, we, we had another meeting in July of 2016. Um, where we were reviewing the work restrictions and reasonable accommodation based on temporary restrictions. So still at that time by the treating physicians and all the information we had was that they were temporary restrictions dated June 29th of 2016. In, in that meeting specifically, um, the, the employee explained that she believed that they, they wouldn't able to enable her to return to work in any capacity for the foreseeable future. But again, the restrictions that we had were temporary. So on a temporary, with the restrictions that we had, we weren't able to accommodate those temporary restrictions in her, I shouldn't say that, we weren't able to provide her a modified duty assignment um, because we could not accommodate those restrictions in her regular position, but we were able to provide leave as a form of accommodation. So we were reviewing the restrictions that were provided to us each and every time. And the decision once the restrictions were permanent were, Again, the no repetitive overhead lifting or work with arms above the shoulder level, and those restrictions specifically could have been accommodated in her position. Do you know why she didn't go back then? Um, she did not. She was indicating that, she, based on the information, the memo that we have, she, uh, I'm sorry, um, the employee felt that she was unable to return to work in any capacity um, and because she had exhausted all of her leaves of absences, so there was modified duty provided for a period of time and then she was on leave as a form of accommodation um, mm -hmm. and because of the length of the leave of a, the leave that she was on, um, she was separated pursuant to her bargaining unit contract um, on July 9th of 2016. Okay, thank you. Any other questions you want to? No. Okay. I have a comment. Sure. Um, so, um, if my memory serves me correctly, I was not given a choice. Basically, I was forced to go into retirement. I tried very, very hard meeting with different people at HR. Basically, they said, we cannot accommodate you. Um, we're going to have to let you go or you have an option to retire. So they forced me to retire. Uh, secondly, um, the job that I was doing as an environmental inspector, I was a um, construction inspector, um, inspecting large construction sites involving wearing a steel toe boots, hard hats, carrying um, a um, computer and files, walking construction sites. Um, this is what they said that they could not accommodate, having a person with everything that I was going through being 
doing construction inspections on huge construction sites or small construction sites um, because of the severity of the physical um, side of the um, job that I was doing. And again, I was not given a choice. I was forced to retire. Okay. Um, so I'm going to move to the next item. Um, do any of the witnesses who have testified have any rebuttal to the testimony currently provided by the applicant or her lawyer? Um, I'm not sure if I'm considered a witness for this purpose. I would like to make one brief comment in response to a uh, statement by the applicant. The applicant indicated she did not have osteoarthritis before the incident, but the incident triggered it. In point of fact, the medical evidence in, in the form of x-rays taken uh, I, uh, in August 2014, if my recollection serves me, showed the presence of the osteoarthritis, and it takes uh, a significant period of time, not just a month, for signs of osteoarthritis to be significant enough to appear in an x-ray. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Um, Todd Johnson, would you like to question any of the witnesses on the rebuttal at all? No, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, Mr. Johnson, Ms. Stegaport, would you like to make a closing statement? So, I'll make a closing statement in that, um, if the committee follows the medical evidence of the neutral evaluators, I think they have to find that the applicant meets the qualifications for a, a disability retirement. Okay. All right. Uh, would any board members like to ask questions of any of the witnesses who have been who have testified? Okay. Trustee Jennings, this is Trustee Chandra. I have a question for um, Russ, if uh, you don't mind. Go for it. Yeah. So, just uh, when when you were setting up the 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 cause of the injury, I just wanted to make sure I understood that this was related to uh, walking up some or, or uh, issue with some stairs um, uh, on city property, and I just want to know was that related to work like at a construction site or was it in a garage just you know going from um into one's car I, I just if you could give a little more color on that and i apologize if i didn't follow closely when you um, were explaining it oh i i didn't explain it any further than that and i apologize if i didn't provide enough uh, uh details though the details of the specific fall are not elaborated in the medical records um the fall occurred at the City Hall garage. Um, the applicant was carrying a computer and some files and fell. Uh, it's not indicated in the records how many, uh, uh, the nature of the fall. Um, it's just that the outcome uh, did not, and I think this is significant, did not result that day in surgery, hospitalization, Instead, the applicant went to a personal physician and received a splint. That's all. Then a month goes by. Now, perhaps the, uh, it, because it is also the case that the uh, right little finger was fractured. The, we certainly concede that, and that's certainly clear in the medical records. Though it was a fracture that Ms. the applicant could live with for a month before seeking uh, medical attention. So, um, the committee considered that the conclusions by Drs. Gravina and Wiedemeyer seem rather grossly disproportionate to the actual event. They, I mean, obviously things have happened, including to 
the applicant's left shoulder. That resulted in surgery in November 2016. Obviously, some, a condition was going on there that resulted in the surgery. But, but to connect that to the comparatively minor July 2014 incident is, frankly, inappropriate and amounts to speculation. If that had been a significant inf incident, there would have been significant treatment, a, treatment uh, 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 a rush to the emergency room or whatever. None of that occurred. Okay, thank you. Do, just as a follow-up to the specific incident, do we know um, if there's any alleged sort of like negligence or poor lighting or the stairs were broken? Like, I'm just trying to understand uh, the actual nature of the fall itself as well. I, I do not have uh, any details what, on that. I apologize. Was the so city, was I can the say something. Um, as a city employee, I've used that parking garage. And I tend to use the stairs when I used to go in, um, both there and City Hall, because it's good exercise. And um, no, stairs are reasonable. Um, you can see what you're doing. Um, ideally, I wouldn't be walking at night there anyhow, um, just for where it is and all, but no. Okay. I'm not aware of anything. There were no claims made of, of uh, negligence or, or I'm forgetting my tort law, but, uh, you know, that the facility was, um, was dangerous. Okay. Thank you. Can I make a comment? Yes. Go ahead. Um, the stairs are used by city employees, the parking lot, um, all city cars at that time, uh, city cars were also parked, um, in the same structure. Mm -hmm. So we would, uh, grab our files and computer and walk from City Hall to the parking structure to go to uh, sit in the city car to um, go do inspections. And a lot of times because of a lot of homeless uh, people um, in that area, uh, they do hose down um, the stairs um, to get rid of uh, uh, smells and things. Um, so I don't remember actually exactly if that day if it was uh, wet or anything, but it was the stairs that I had used for many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, um, uh, commenting on um, what Russ made a comment about um, uh, the sequence of events, there was a lot of discrepancy in the way um, the dates and visits from doctors were reported. Um, what I would like to let you know um, the reason I'm here today and I'm wasting everybody's time is all because of the neglect from the beginning. If I had given the right care when this thing happened, if I was giving the surgery that I needed right away, I wouldn't be here. I would go to the U.S. Health Works on a regular basis, talking to the surgeon, letting him know that I was in severe pain. And he just kept putting it off, putting it off, and giving me pain medication instead. Hey, here's a big bottle of pain medication. Go take it. And I kept saying, this is bad. This is bad. I need care. He waited four months, five months to do the surgery. And by that time, it was already too late. And three months after the surgery, I'm still in severe pain. I go back to him. And I asked him, so what is going on? And then he says, oh, let's go look at your x-ray. He puts the x-ray on the wall and shows me that he couldn't correct the problem that was caused by the fall on my, my small finger. And I said, why not? I mean, that was the reason we had the surgery. And he says, oh, well, the bone had already um, uh, healed. I didn't think it would be right to uh, break it. And I said, well, wasn't that the point of the surgery to set it correctly? He said, yeah, yeah, but I didn't do it. And then here are your other fingers. You see all these chipped bones floating in your other fingers. And I'm sa I said, what is the, what is the cure for it? What, is the, what, is, what are we going to do about this? Oh, there's nothing we can do. So it was all because of neglect. If I had received the care that I needed at that point, when the, uh, when the whole accident happened, 
I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be, I would be living a full life and I wouldn't be wasting your time right now. Okay. I was not given the care I needed to recover from the injury. Thank you. Uh, is there any other board comments? No. Um, I would like, uh, just because I happen to sit on the disability committee and have gone through some uh, extensive training at this point, um, there is an attachment that was in there that goes through the disability guidelines that help determine our decision on this matter. And so for those members of the board who are not on the disability and have not a committee and, and received the training, um, I, I think it's appropriate to just read that out one more time and not in all the detail, but maybe just the major components. Uh, Russ, do you wanna uh, do that? Just, you know, mm -hmm. The disability questions, just item one, two, three, four, five, you know, so that. I, I wish I had that available. Oh, I can. Like Chair Jennings, I apologize. I. That's all right. It's on the, it's on the attachment, um, but I, I can do it. It's uh, the second attachment in the uh, packet. So the disability questions is, is the applicant permanently incapacitated for the performance of duty? Uh, number two, did the disability occur while the applicant was an employee of the city and or a member of the federated system? Was the applicant disabled at the time of separation? Was the application filled within four months of the date of separation? Or if not, has the disability been continuous since the date of separation? And then the last one, um, uh, did the disability arise out of and in the course of city service? All right, so it goes through the basic things. And um, so one of the major items that Russ has um, educated us on is if there are accommodations that were offered and they could still do their work, um, that is uh, something that, you know, has to be, you know, that they cannot do their work, right? Um, so, and as to surgery, um, that is one thing that is not um, our um, purview uh, to determine. That is not something the city um, would uh, put on the employee to do. It is their uh, right or not right, you know. So, um, I, I think that one argument there is really, um, an issue more with uh, her relationship with the doctor or whatever that piece, but it's not a city obligation to require a person to get surgery. In fact, it is something that we are not to re acquire. So um, require. Uh, so uh, Russ, did I kind of do the due diligence here? You, you sure did. Okay, great. All right, so given that, um, no more questions from anybody else? Okay, I now close the hearing for board deliberation. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Um, and so maybe can someone walk me through that next step? <laughs> uh, no, this is just Julie, the, the, the discussion on, on the hearing is sort of completed. So now it goes back to the board. Uh, to make any kind of statements or questions or deliberations so that you can form a motion and make a decision on the disability. Okay. So do I have, um, is there any other discussion that the board would like to uh, go forward with or discuss or ask? I think we've already kind of gone through that, right? Um, so I have a couple things. Uh, sure. Thank you, Trustee Linder. Um, first of all, Having a hearing like this is not a waste of time. Yeah. Something that the former employee is, has a right to do and it's important. So um, I do not, and I don't think the board considers it a waste of time to hear this out. The, the struggle I'm having is that while I can acknowledge the pain that the former employee is going through, I have yet I'm still having the struggle making the connection between the initial incident um, 
the the issues that happened related to it, but not connected, actually connected to that initial fall and where the situation is today and how it's gotten exacerbated. I just don't see that. Uh, so that's um, that's kind of where my, my thinking is. And I appreciate all the information that's been presented on both sides. Um, I regret that we don't have one of the doctors that the attorney was referring to as a witness, um, but that's how it goes. Um, so I'm leaning to supporting the, the staff's uh, recommendation at this point for those reasons. Do you want to put a motion? Sure. I move that the board support the recommendations of the staff disability committee. Okay, uh, motion which is, is so to decline, which is to decline. Right. So the motion is to uh, decline the uh, um, service work disability application by trustee Linder. Do I have a second? Yeah, this is Trustee Kelleher. And first off, I would like to say I'm so sorry that you're in this pain. Um, I also suffer from arthritis and um, uh, Deputrin's contracture on my right hand. So I understand what it's like to sort of lose the ability to use your dominant hand. Um, however, given uh, Russ's um, comment that the x-rays and the medical evidence showed that there was already arthritis and progression. Um, I just, uh, I'm gonna have to second the motion and it is with a, uh, it's not an easy second for me, but I will second motion to deny the, um, the claim. Okay, so there is a second by trustee Kelleher. Um, so uh, any further, uh, input from uh, trustees or the public? Okay, I will do a roll call vote. Um, going forward, trustees, oh wait a minute, yeah, okay. So I had, sorry, I make sure I'm off of mute. Trustee Chandra? Uh, yes, I vote aye for Trustee Linder's motion. Okay, Trustee Kelleher? I also vote aye. Trustee Linder? Aye. Trustee Avosti? I would aye. And I am Vice Chair Jennings. I will uh, also vote aye. And um, the motion carries. Um, the request is denied. And um, we wish you um, uh, that you can continue uh, to move forward and move on. Um, but we apologize. We are unable to support this request at this time. So um, that uh, concludes that. Um, if we go back to our agenda, I think we were pretty much at the end. Uh, okay, thank you for hearing our case. Okay, thank you very much. Thank um, you. I appreciate thank you. your attendance and sorry for the bad news. Um, so going on to, we've kind of done everything, right? Uh, yes, I think you actually went to the, if, if staff can move the agenda to the, uh, to the end of the, the last page so that, uh, my chair Jennings can, yeah. So I think you did, I think, everything. you know, you went over the different options on the, on the calendar for, uh, um, yep. you can move it up just a little bit. On the I different, think we're currently yeah. at proposed agenda items. Is That's there right, exactly. That's proposed correct. agenda items. I have my iPad open, you see. <laughs> and uh, no, no proposed. Okay, then I adjourn this meeting. Our next meeting will be March 16th, 2023. Um, I believe we're going to, um, are we going to start the committees going forward? Correct.